Okay. Thanks to all my students and uh, colleagues uh, connected remotely to be present at today's lecture from Professor uh, Michele Romanelli from uh, Tokamak Energy. Uh, I know Michele since a long time during our years before at the NEAT and at JET. So I'm very happy uh, to, to hear about this uh, uh, new challenge uh, with the private company and the spherical tokamaks in uh, tokamak energy. Uh, we are already collaborating uh, uh, for some uh, research uh, with the uh, EU. Uh, so and uh, today, happy for my students of uh, mechanical engineering master uh, to help listen to this, uh, this nice lecture that I already read uh, in the, the previous days uh, interacting with uh, Michele. Thanks again, Michele. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pepe, for the introduction. Uh, so I have uh, uh, two hours for the, this uh, lecture, and I divided it in uh, uh, in two parts. Uh, and hopefully, we can have also a little bit of break between uh, between the two uh, the two parts of the lecture. So yes, you have, you, you have uh, ten minutes between. Them. You can do 50, 10 minutes, and then if I, uh, the, the last hour. Very good. Very good. Okay, so let me start with the first. Uh, the first lecture. Uh, so in this first lecture, I will go through, uh, as the title says, uh, the physics and engineering of spherical tokamak. Obviously, this is a, a huge, uh, you know, um, topic. And uh, uh, what I will do is uh, just to touch upon certain uh, interesting features. Uh, I will not go deeply in details uh, on e everything because otherwise that will take basically one lecture for each uh, subject. Uh, but let me start uh, with the main question, which is uh, what are the differences? Uh, it's a rhetoric question. Is there any difference between conventional tokamaks and spherical tokamaks? Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, so let's see what, what the differences are. You see already in the picture, uh, the, the shape is very different. Uh, uh, the, on the left hand side, you have uh, Tor Supra, which is a conventional tokamak. Um, and I chose this picture because I, uh, in the past, I also worked at uh, Tor Supra, and it was a nice uh, circular cross section uh, tokamak, uh, large, say, medium size. And on the right hand side, uh, you have uh, ST40, of which I will uh, speak at, at length. Uh, later on. So the question is, what are the differences between conventional tokamak and spherical tokamak? So let me start uh, from uh, the very beginning. Uh, I will uh, address the confining magnetic field and the safety factor, a comparison between spherical tokamaks uh, and co uh, conventional tokamaks, uh, particle trajectories. I will cover a particle trajectory, then neoclassical transport, turbulent transport, global confinement. I will then uh, discuss uh, uh, briefly the energy stability and the role of elongation and high beta. Then I will uh, uh, tell you a little bit about the scape of layer characteristics, the width of the scape of layer, which is a very important uh, parameter, the connection length of the magnetic field lines in the scape of layer. And then I will move to the engineering uh, challenges for spherical tokamaks. And uh, finally, I will have a few slides on the, uh, the main uh, feature developed by Tokamak Energy, which is the superconducting technology. Okay, so let's start uh, from the magnetic field. Um, I wanted to start from the very beginning. So as you uh, know very well, uh, if you have uh, um, a coil like this, and it's a straight coil, the magnetic field inside the coil is uh, uniform. There's no uh, variation, so it's uniform, it's confined inside the, the, the coil. And uh, the intensity of the, of the magnetic field depends on the number of turns of the coil, uh, the current that flows in the coil, and the magnetic uh, and mu. And now, if you, uh, if you uh, let's say, close this uh, uh, straight coil into um, a torus, which is basically a donut shape. 
uh, geometrical uh, structure. Uh, then what happens is that uh, so what happens is that you introduce a new length scale, which is the radius of curvature of this torus, and the magnetic field in the torus uh, is, uh, is becomes non non uniform inside inside the coil, and uh, the the intensity of the magnetic field scales with the major radius or radius of curvature of the coil. So here on the right hand side, you have uh, uh, the uh, radius, which is given by R1, which is the radius of the ring. And then A is the what we call later on the minor radius of our tokamak. And you see that the, the total radius of, uh, 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 of the magnetic field, the position of the magnetic field is R1 plus A. And the magnetic field has uh, the intensity has the same functional dependence on the number of uh, turns times the current that is flowing in the in the loop, and uh, uh, but it scales as uh, one over R1 plus A. So this R1 plus A, later on we call it the major radius of your tokamak, and the, the total magnetic field scales as uh, one one over R. Uh, why is this important? We will see it. Uh, in a minute. So this is a configuration of a conventional tokamak. Uh, let, let's say that this is a, a view from, from the top. If you remember the picture of uh, Tor Supra, uh, you have uh, uh, toroidal field coils seen from the top, and then uh, a central solenoid, which is the, the, the a central solenoid that drives uh, the um, current in the plasma, the plasma current by ramping up the central solenoid the current. And so here the main parameters are the major radius of the plasma and the minor radius of the plasma, which are indicated as a, a capital R and small r. And you see in a conventional tokamak, the so-called aspect ratio, which is the ratio between the major radius and the minor radius, is typically something of the order of three. Um, the other feature is that uh, in, a in a conventional tokamak, the plasma tends to fill the whole vacuum vessel, uh, which is very, let's say, close to the toroidal field coils. And I have stressed again here that the, 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 the toroidal field dependency in terms of uh, uh, major radius is one over R and is not uniform inside the, the toroidal field coils. There are other features that I will not discuss, like uh, uh, toroidal field ripple, due to the fact that uh, there is a uh, there is a distant uh, there is, there is um, the, uh, not a continuous of uh, toroidal field coils. There are gaps between the toroidal field coils, but this is not uh, important for us at the moment. What is important is to understand that uh, the magnetic field intensity of the toroidal magnetic field is higher um, on what we call the high field side. And the low field size, sorry, higher on this side than on this side, and this becomes much more important in a uh, in a spherical tokamak, where what happens is that uh, the toroidal field coils are pushed towards the central solenoid and packed very tightly uh, to in 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 the in the very center. So again, here. Um, the spherical tokamak doesn't necessarily have to be small. It's interesting to have it small, but it doesn't have to be small. You can have spherical tokamak of major radius three meter, uh, like a jet. Um, it's interesting to have a spherical tokamak much more compact than that, as we will see. But the important thing is that in a spherical tokamak, the plasma is very, say, close to the axis of the symmetry of the torus. And it's very uh, close to the, let's say, toroidal field coils inner, inner legs. So typically, the plasma will not occupy the old, uh, the old volume of the vacuum basin, and we will be more pushed towards the inner side or, or what we call the high field side. The so spherical tokamak has an aspect ratio typically less than uh, than two. Or uh, another interesting parameter is the inverse aspect ratio, which is uh, called typically epsilon. Uh, and in a spherical tokamak is greater than 0.5. The reason why this uh, parameter is called epsilon is that for conventional tokamak, tokamaks, uh, this quantity is uh, uh, typically small. 
uh, it's not very small, it's 0 0.3, but, uh, uh, but it's considered small in many, in many uh, theories uh, where people do expansion in this inverse aspect ratio parameter. And in a, in a spherical token, because this uh, uh, inverse aspect ratio it becomes large, the expansion, the ordering in epsilon becomes less uh, uh, or, or not, not applicable, let's say. Okay, so having said that, let's have a look at the magnetic field uh, dependency on, on R. So here I show the, the toroidal magnetic field. You know that uh, now it's going as one over R. And so conventional tokamak operate uh, at large R. And if this is uh, in blue, the box is the span of, the, of your plasma, say it's centered here. This is uh, the high field side and the low field side. You see in this cartoon that the high field side uh, magnetic field is as is larger than the low field side, but the difference is not uh, not big. Let's say it's a, it's a um, um, it's not a large difference. However, when you go to spherical tokamaks, you have pushed your plasma very close to the axis to the to the toroidal field course, so um, inner leg. So you see that uh, uh, now the difference between the magnetic field on the high field side and the dome field side is really, really much, much bigger. And this has a lot of uh, interesting uh, implication. I think this is one of the characteristics that we have to keep, uh, to keep in mind. Uh, the magnetic, the toroidal magnetic field varies uh, very strongly over the magnetic surfaces of a spherical tokamak, much, much uh, more than in a conventional tokamak, and you can already imagine lots of implication in terms of physics. Okay, so the other interesting difference is depicted here on the uh, in this slide uh, in terms of magnetic field line. So on the left hand side, you have the magnetic field lines on a magnetic surface in a conventional tokamak, and you see that uh, the field line has a certain pitch angle. And uh, it evolves from uh, low field side to high field side, uh, as usual. But it keeps uh, the same, uh, the same, say uh, m over q, uh, m, over, m over n. So the same q uh, safety factor. Uh, whereas, uh, if you have, uh, if you look at a spherical tokamak, what happens is that uh, the magnetic field line has a, a, a certain um, um, inclination on the low field side. And then on the high field side, it becomes basically toroidal. So the field lines in a spherical tokamak on the high field side are toroidal field lines. The poloidal field component is uh, very small and negligible compared to the, to the very high uh, toroidal field component. And therefore, particles uh, will, uh, will spiral uh, in, the, in, the, in the middle of the a spherical tokamak and spend a lot of time, a lot of time uh, there, those particles that manage to uh, to pass the the mirror of the magnetic field, they will live quite a long time in the in the center of the spherical tokamak. This is an, another interesting feature. Okay, so before before I move to the um, let's say uh, more quantitative uh, uh, analysis, let me introduce a, a, a coordinate system that I will be using uh, in, in some of the plots. Uh, later on and in some of the calculations that I will show you to highlight the difference between uh, conventional tokamak and spherical tokamak. So I'm, I'll be using this uh, uh, toroidal uh, system of coordinates uh, and, uh, and this is the map which shows as, as uh, how the toroidal system of coordinates uh, maps into the Cartesian coordinates. So this is depicted here on the left hand side. Uh, Z is uh, the same axis of symmetry of the uh, of the torus, um, R, R, R not is the, um, let's say, the position of the magnetic axis, and R with R, uh, capital R is the distance of uh, your particle from the from Z. Uh, but the system of coordinates is uh, basically small R, theta, which is this uh, angle, azimuthal angle and uh, uh, phi is the coordinate in the toroidal direction. And this is how phi, theta, and small r, which I call the psi here for, uh, for reasons that will be clear later, uh, are defined uh, uh, in this way um, 
using the Cartesian coordinates. Uh, the reason why I used Psi is because uh, um, where, where, while R is a good coordinate in a circular uh, plasma, let's say, um, in, uh, in elongated uh, and more realistic plasmas, uh, we use uh, something else uh, to label the, the radial coordinate. But for, for, for uh, now, just uh, consider Psi equal to, to R. Okay, so given this system of coordinates, uh, let me show you a picture that I found very interesting. The first time I plotted it uh, in 2011, uh, and it's the magnetic field lines on a magnetic surface uh, in phi and theta. So in uh, phi, so we, we focus now on a, a flux surface, one of these flux surfaces. We focus on the flux surface, and so we open the flux surface on, on a plane. We be, it becomes a, a two-dimensional object uh, on a plane, let's say. And the two coordinates along the flux, flux surface are theta in this direction and phi in this direction. And so the magnetic field line, if I take a, a flux surface uh, of uh, uh, aspect ratio 0.1, the magnetic field line uh, on the, in the phi theta map of the flux surface are straight lines, which have a straight, uh, uh, which have one, one unique uh, uh, inclination, let's say. Uh, but if you go to epsilon 0.8, which is the, uh, the this uh, let's say more external uh, flux surface in uh, in a spherical tokamak, you see that uh, for theta equals zero, yeah. On the outer side, outer side, so low field side, the, the the magnetic field lines resemble uh, the, the the lines on a on a conventional tokamak. But then, as you move towards the in the high field side, the magnetic field lines becomes uh, become uh, toroidal. They become pretty flat on this map. So uh, going in the phi direction rather than having a poloidal component. And so this is interesting because that means that uh, Q as doesn't, doesn't have a straight Q as the safety factor, which typically uh, it's related to the, um, to the angle of the field line on the magnetic surface. Uh, doesn't have a, uh, it's not uniform over the magnetic surface and uh, you have to define it as a Q on the outer uh, side of the magnetic surface rather than on the inner side where it tends to be uh, pretty large. Uh, and so this is uh, uh, this has an implication on uh, uh, particle uh, uh, trajectories. It has implication on MHD stability. It has implication on uh, on transport uh, in terms of collisional transport, for example. Uh, and I will show you I will show you that. But before I show you that, uh, I need to introduce another concept, which is the concept of the flux surface averages, uh, because that's uh, something that is used in uh, in calculating, for example, uh, uh, part, uh, a transport uh, uh, over magnetic surfaces, and it's what is used by many of the of the codes that assume that quantities are uh, uh, uniform, not uniform, but uh, are uh, one-dimensional. So they they make uh, flux surface averages of density, temperatures, uh, temperature, and so on. So let's see what uh, how the flux surface average. Uh, uh, looks like uh, in a in a spherical tokamak, uh, uh, and how does it compare with the conventional tokamak? Okay, let me introduce just uh, uh, briefly uh, the concept of uh, flux surface average. So let's consider now uh, a toroidal uh, flux surface. Let's call it the torus, like like this, and let's consider uh, on on the torus a function, which could be anything. It could be your density, your temperature. Uh, anything, uh, anything you you can think of. Uh, it's a scalar function; it's not an, a vector, and that will be a function of uh, psi, phi, and theta, the three coordinates. Uh, in particular, if you are on this surface, psi will be fixed. It will have a value, the value of this surface, of the psi of this surface, and uh, uh, and so uh, we want to introduce now the concept of the flux surface average of this uh, function. So what we do is uh, we define it. Uh, as follows. So it's basically uh, the integral. Here you see the integral in uh, theta and phi. So you do the integral in theta and phi of your function times, uh, of course, the Jacobian that takes in, into account the metric uh, on, the, on the surface. 
and they you take the limit of delta that goes to zero uh, of uh, a little volume around uh, around uh, your, uh, your surface uh, um, uh, which becomes uh, smaller and smaller so you make the you make a volume integral this is a volume integral uh, but you make the limit uh, of the volume uh, that goes to zero so that shrinks uh, into a, a surface and then obviously you, you divide by uh, the, the area of the surface which is defined by this other integral here where there is no uh, function in the in the in integrate function f in the integral and this will be uh, because you are integrated in theta and phi and psi is the only variable surviving this uh, uh, this integral this will be a function of, of of psi so the so you have found a way to reduce a three dimensional function into a one dimensional function thanks to the flux surface average uh, operator now let's make a couple of examples. If you consider a very straightforward uh, um, circular, circular plasma where the Jacobian is uh, simply uh, r, small r, and then r0 plus uh, r cos theta, you can calculate this, uh, the area of the magnetic surface uh, by taking this limit uh, and calculating this integral. And you see that it becomes uh, 4 pi square are not psi or are not r and this is what uh, you expect then you plug it in uh, into the uh, definition of the flux surface uh, average and you get this uh, um, uh, 1 over 2 pi r integral between 0 and 2 pi uh, in just in d theta so we have done now the integral in uh, in phi and the integral in psi so it basically the flux surface average becomes uh, simply um, uh, an integral in theta Okay, let's make an example for, uh, for uh, the density. Uh, I found this nice picture of uh, uh, a flux surface average with some density, non-uniform density of chocolate on the top. So if you, uh, so if you have uh, um, density, this could be the density of your, uh, I don't know, tungsten, carbon, in this case it's just chocolate. And uh, uh, the question is, what is the flux surface average of this chocolate? Uh, density on uh, on the top of your donut uh, and we can calculate it like this let's define the density of chocolate in this case uh, the density is uh, um, a constant uh, between zero and pi so between zero theta zero and pi and it's basically zero uh, at the bottom between pi and two pi so what that means is that uh, when you take the integral, you put the you make it basically the integral only between zero and pi because the rest is zero, and uh, uh, and you get this result. Uh, it the density is half of the density of the chocolate on the top. Okay, so this is what uh, you would expect because the surface, uh, the 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 upper surface of your donut is the same as the lower surface of your donut. Uh, so the expected result. However, the the, the things are different if the chocolate is on the uh, low field side only and not uh, between zero and, and pi. So suppose that now the density of chocolate is between uh, zero and pi and a half. So from here to there, in the middle, and between uh, uh, three and a half pi and two pi. So basically uh, uh, the bottom. So I am thinking about chocolate uh, just localized uh, on the, uh, so let's call it low field side of your. Of your donut. So if that is the case, then the integral is uh, uh, changes and is different. When you do the flux surface average, uh, you get uh, the result uh, that we got before, half of the density uh, of the chocolate, but you get also another term which is proportional to the um, inverse aspect ratio of the tokamak, uh, of, the, of, the, of the donut, sorry. So the larger is the inverse aspect ratio, the larger is this uh, uh, flux surface average. Um, and uh, uh, you can see it clearly in if you calculate just the area. So if you put uh, nc0 uh, equal to 1 and you just calculate the area of a, a conventional tokamak, and uh, uh, the, you, you get that basically the difference between the area uh, on the low field side and the area on the high field side is proportional to, uh, to psi over R0. Uh, which is uh, what they call the uh, epsilon. So this difference is larger in spherical tokamaks than conventional tokamaks. 
So with this, I wanted to just to show you that uh, if you do simple uh, averages uh, in convention in spherical token, you get uh, 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 you get uh, larger values uh, just because the area on the uh, low field side is uh, larger than the high field side. And this is particularly important when you go and calculate things like fluxes, uh, because fluxes. For, this is an example of particle flux. Uh, fluxes are flux surface averages of quantities such as uh, the product of density times the velocity for the particle flux. And, uh, and this gives you the various terms here. Uh, if you consider simply collisional, collisional flux or Fischluter uh, flux, is, this is the term of the Fischluter particle flux. And this is the uh, E cross B, uh, sorry, uh, this is the so called well pinch. Uh, and you see there are flux surface areas. So you expect that uh, because of the uh, because of the differences in the in the surface of a spherical tokamak uh, compared to conventional tokamak, these fluxes uh, uh, will be different. In this uh, uh, simulation that uh, we did uh, in 2011, uh, we took a uh, uh, lot of particles. We put them on a, on a magnetic surface, uh, starting uh, uh, starting uh, from a magnetic surface, and we let them collide. In this case, they were uh, carbon particles, so impurity, and we let them collide uh, uh, with uh, uh, the background plasma. And we watched uh, how the particles uh, diffused from their initial radial position, so for, from their initial psi, to uh, in in time. Uh, so that we were looking at the collision transport, uh, and we were in actually calculating the full uh, full orbit of this particle. So we included also finite orbit effects. And what we found is uh, uh, that is shown here on the left hand side, uh, the scaling with collisionality. Um, so the blue, the, the, the red dots are the, the scaling for a, for a, um, a larger spectral tokamak. And, um, and the blue dot, the, the blue uh, diamonds are the case of a, a spherical tokamak. And you see that the diffusivity uh, shows a deviation, which is due to both the finite orbit effect and the um, and the the different uh, the different in uh, in the geometry that I was uh, discussing uh, discussing before. So this to tell you that uh, uh, transport uh, already just collisional transport in a spherical tokamak uh, you have to expect uh, that it will be it will be different than, than in a conventional tokamak. Um, last week we started to operate ST40. And uh, this was one of the first plasmas we, we got uh, uh, during this restart operation. And I found that it was uh, pretty nice uh, because it shows uh, the magnetic field lines, basically the particles flying along the magnetic field lines that spiral around the central central post. And it reminded me very well, very much the, the simulation that they did, although this was not ST40, this was a must, but a uh, very, uh, very similar picture. Okay. So let me move to uh, trapped particle and bootstrap current. For what I, from what I told you so far, due to the differences in uh, uh, magnetic field geometry, uh, you uh, and the intensity most of all over the magnetic surfaces, and the, the fact that things vary so much over the magnetic surface, you can imagine that uh, this will impact uh, uh, the fraction of trapped particles. In fact, it was uh, shown uh, by by uh, many authors that the fractional trapped particles uh, in a, in a spherical tokamak with same uh, uh, parameters, let's say with same plasma temperature density uh, and so on, uh, of a conventional toy, the fractional trapped particle is, uh, appears to be uh, to be larger. The calculation is not straightforward, so one has really to compute uh, the calculate to calculate the fractional trapped particles. Uh, on the spherical tokamak, uh, uh, rather than rely on scaling like uh, uh, for uh, uh, um, a smaller inverse aspect ratio uh, expansions, uh, we know that uh, the fraction of particles in larger aspect ratio tokamak scales like a square root of epsilon, uh, but this is not uh, uh, valid in a spherical tokamak. It's actually valid only for a very small uh, inverse aspect ratios. Uh, the other important uh, um, uh, uh, quantity that is related to trapped particles is the so-called bootstrap current. So the bootstrap current is due to the fact that when you have trapped particles, 
um, and you have a density gradient, uh, the, the velocity, uh, the, there is basically a, a net velocity uh, due to the, to the density gradients itself in the toroidal direction. So that, that translates into basically a current. And this current can, is called bootstrap current because it's basically driven by the pressure gradient. It's proportional to the pressure gradient. Uh, uh, and here in the large aspect ratio approximation is proportional to the aspect ratio itself. Now, it, I will show you in the next slides that uh, a spherical tokamak can sustain uh, a large beta and, uh, and, and pressure gradients. So that means that in spherical tokamak, we can have a, a much larger uh, booster uh, current fraction. Now, why spherical tokamak can sustain a high beta uh, is, uh, uh, is, is a big chapter, let's say. It's an important topic. But basically, the thing is that uh, beta is limited by several instabilities in a, in a tokamak, in a plasma by several instabilities. Uh, so you can have uh, ballooning modes that limit beta, resistible modes, uh, uh, neoclassical tailing modes. Uh, and so the, the, the natural uh, geometry of a spherical tokamak uh, uh, is that of, a, as you have seen before, uh, is that of a strongly elongated plasma. And it's found that uh, if you have a strongly elongated plasma, most of these uh, uh, instabilities are uh, uh, basically either suppressed or reduced. So it, it is uh, uh, consistent with uh, uh, lots of, uh, let's say, scaling of beta, of the beta limit uh, that were found in time. Here you see that uh, from 1973, people thought, thought that uh, the beta, uh, beta limit uh, scaled with one over the aspect ratio. Then they found that the beta limit scaled with the elongation. So at the end, the scaling has evolved uh, uh, consistently with, uh, uh, with uh, um, the availability of uh, experimental data. But what uh, uh, remained is the, uh, the fact that the, the beta, uh, maximum beta that you can achieve in a plasma scales with the uh, with elongation and uh, um, uh, spherical tokamaks operate naturally at highly elongated plasmas. So that's why uh, in uh, experiments, uh, it was found uh, uh, on, on start. Uh, this is a, a, spher a small spherical tokamak that was operated uh, at Calum, that uh, it was possible to push uh, uh, the beta limit uh, to normalize beta of the level of the six, uh, uh, whereas uh, uh, other the, uh, the conventional tokamaks uh, uh, basically had the upper limit uh, around uh, uh, 3.5 or 3. Okay, so for example, here you see an old picture where uh, uh, where it shows the beta limit achieved on several tokamaks. The best performance in terms of beta uh, was uh, obtained on D3D. Um, at uh, moderately large currents. And you see that the beta limit, the beta uh, obtained was about uh, uh, beta toroidal 10% and beta normalized 3.5. This needs to be compared with the results of, uh, of uh, uh, START, where a beta uh, normalized of, uh, of 6 was achieved in this, uh, uh, in this pulse. So this made uh, uh, people think that uh, in spherical tokamak one can uh, really operate a very high beta. And this is beneficial uh, uh, for various reasons. Uh, first of all, for economical reason, if you can uh, uh, operate a beta, it means you don't need a, a strong magnetic field to, to get, uh, to confine a large, uh, uh, a large pressure. So in principle, you can build a cheaper, a cheaper tokamak. The other interesting uh, uh, feature uh, of the spherical tokamak uh, is uh, uh, the impact uh, of, uh, of the magnetic uh, topology, let's say, uh, on, uh, on the turbulent transport. So we discussed so far collisional transport. We said that uh, collisional samples will be different uh, due to, uh, to, the, to, 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 to the various aspects uh, that we discussed uh, before. Uh, but what about turbulent transport? Okay, so in turbulent transport, uh, uh, 
uh, you uh, rely on in, in, in many, let's say, uh, simulations, you rely on concept of flux tubes. So this picture shows you a flux tube in a, in a, in a spherical tokamak, where you, have, where you see that uh, you have the flux tube spiraling around uh, in the uh, inner uh, uh, high-field side of the tokamak. And uh, what happens is that the magnetic field in the flux tube the toroidal magnetic field in the flux tubes changes uh, uh, strongly when you go from low field side to the high field side. So, a rho, uh, the Larmor radius, will also change uh, in the parallel direction of the flux tube. But gyrokinetic assumes that the parallel direction, uh, the variation in the parallel direction is, uh, is uh, small. No? So, lambda parallel over lambda perp uh, is uh, 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 large, so it's large. So things are evolving. Things, the vortices are, have a structure that uh, uh, it's uh, uh, in the in the perpendicular direction, whereas in the parallel direction things should be pretty pretty uniform. However, because of the change in the uh, magnetic field, the strong change in the magnetic field in the toroidal direction, uh, this uh, um, uh, this is challenged. <laughs> this uh, assumption is challenged within uh, within a spherical tokamak. So you should expect. Uh, that things uh, will look uh, uh, a bit different uh, than uh, uh, so even turbulent transport will look a bit different uh, in spherical tokamaks uh, than in conventional tokamak. There is another ingredient that will impact the turbulent transport that is the uh, high beta. So we said that the spherical tokamak because of the uh, high elongation and because of the uh, com magnetic uh, configuration uh, is uh, uh, capable of operating at uh, much higher betas than uh, than uh, conventional tokamaks, and this means that uh, the uh, turbulence uh, is not uh, uh, will not be electrostatic as uh, uh, observed uh, in in many conventional tokamaks, uh, but will be rather more uh, electromagnetic. So due to the to the to higher beta effects, and so um, electromagnetic turbulence will uh, uh, will look. Uh, we look different and we'll have a different level of uh, fluxes, uh, uh, nonlinear fluxes, than, than what, uh, uh, what we have on uh, conventional tokamaks. Uh, the chapter of uh, calculation of the turbine transport in uh, spherical tokamaks is still, uh, still open. People are doing uh, uh, research. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so we still wait for uh, final, let's say, results uh, on this. But uh, uh, this is just to flag. Uh, uh, what you should expect uh, that will happen in a spherical tokamak compared to a conventional tokamak. Let me now go to the global confinement. Uh, and here also we have some uh, interesting uh, surprises. Uh, so when we compare the, uh, the global confinement uh, observed in spherical tokamak with the global confinement of the uh, ether, for example, for the ether uh, IPB98, uh, we see that uh, uh, by taking, for example, data from uh, from an STX, uh, um, which is one of the spherical tokamaks, that the dependency on the on the plasma current of confinement uh, is weaker in a spherical tokamak, whereas the dependence on the magnetic field is uh, uh, is uh, uh, much much stronger uh, than in uh, uh, let's say conventional tokamak, according to the ITER uh, ninety eight uh, scaling. And this means that uh, uh, by, uh, the, by, by uh, increasing the, the magnetic field, uh, we might expect to have a, a much better confinement in a spherical tokamak than uh, in, a, in a conventional tokamak at the, same, uh, at the same magnetic field. So that is why we are now exploring uh, uh, high field spherical tokamaks at uh, uh, tokamak energy, because we would like to confirm this uh, this uh, scaling. Uh, obviously, one can say that uh, the ITER scaling is based on many, many tokamaks, uh, whereas the spherical tokamak scaling uh, has a much, uh, let's say, reduced uh, database. So that's why we need to include uh, uh, many more points to, to be sure that this scaling holds. But it's interesting to flag that uh, uh, a a scaling Based on this data of spherical tokamak, would uh, um, would uh, uh, predict, uh, let's say, a factor three uh, enhancement over the ether 
uh, eta scaling when applied to the plasma parameters of a, of a spherical, of a, let's say, fusion grade uh, spherical tokamak plasma. Now, let's talk about uh, the scrape of layer. Okay, so we said that uh, uh, the core of the plasma has a lot of uh, interesting uh, feature, uh, high boost of current, high beta, possibly improved confinement. What about the scrape of layer? So, um, again, we have to rely on, uh, on an STX and, uh, and uh, uh, the height scaling for the width of the scrape of layer. The width of the scrape of layer is an important parameter because it tells you uh, on, it tells you basically the surface on which the power that go, flows from the plasma down to the diverter will be dissipated. If you have a very narrow scrape of layer, that means uh, uh, you will be focusing all the power down to the diverter in a very narrow region, and you will act uh, to basically burn your, uh, your diverter. If you can enlarge the wetted surface, uh, then uh, then obviously that means enlarging the width of the scrape of layer, and obviously that the 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 diverter will uh, will be much much happier. So what we see here is in the the, the high scaling, and you see that uh, the width of the scrape of layer scales with this lambda q scales with the bipoloidal as one over r. Uh, sorry, <laughs> one over bipoloidal, and. Uh, um, uh, there are some little small deviations that we have investigated for JET, but uh, these are not uh, being found uh, uh, significant. But when you do simulations for uh, uh, NSTX at higher bipoloidal, you find that uh, uh, this is NSTX at 1.5 megaamp fits it falls into the, the the other data in the database. But when you go to two megaamps. Uh, you see a strong deviation from the uh, from the scaling. So this was calculated. That the width of the scrape of layer for an STX uh, upgrade was calculated uh, using uh, uh, XGC uh, one, which is a, a particle in cell uh, full global uh, um, gyrokinetic uh, code. You see here a cross section of the uh, field calculated by uh, XGC one. You see the turbine structures. Uh, and from this turbulent structure, calculate the flux parallel and perpendicular to the uh, to the scrape of layer field lines, and you can calculate the width of the scrape of layer. There is a presentation by CS Chang at the IAA conference uh, uh, next next month in a few weeks' time, uh, exactly on this. The other important uh, uh, important interesting uh, observation is that uh, uh, from the Ike scaling. Lambda Q seems to depend on uh, uh, the inverse surface ratio uh, to the power 0.42. Uh, and therefore, if you have go to um, uh, large or larger inverse aspect ratio, you expect uh, even from just the empirical scaling that uh, the, uh, uh, the wetted area will be increased. So that's just good news for uh, spherical tokamak. Uh, some spherical tokamaks, uh, and this needs to be confirmed. And we have experiments on uh, and NST40 and NSTXU when it will become operative uh, to confirm this deviation from the uh, from the scaling. Okay. So, however, of course, uh, there are also some challenges in building a, a, a spherical tokamak uh, for uh, power production, for fusion power uh, production. So, obviously, the the diverter is one of the uh, main challenges, despite uh, we might rely on a, a larger wetted area. The fact that the machine is compact and, uh, uh, and, and, and in, it, it, this makes uh, uh, you know, the, the need to dissipate uh, power uh, in, the, in the diverter also very important. So as you know, there are different solutions that have been explored and are presently explored. Like, for example, flux expansion and the super X, uh, super X uh, di diverter for uh, uh, lowering the, uh, the, the power uh, here. The other, the other thing is uh, the previous scaling here is all uh, uh, the data were all from uh, single null diverted plasmas. Uh, it is uh, uh, usually uh, thought that uh, spherical tokamak will operate in a double null configuration. So what will be the scaling double null? Uh, it needs to be uh, to be explored. 
uh, and also what will be the width of the scape of layer in general and the difference between high field side and low field side will also be explored in uh, in the experiments uh, that we are running on ST40. Uh, another very important technical challenge is the problem of the center column. As you have seen, a spherical tokamak is obtained by pushing the uh, the coils, uh, the toroidal coils, to towards the center of the machine and reducing uh, dramatically the space for uh, a central column or central solenoid. So, because the space is uh, reduced, uh, it's not really often possible to uh, to have a, a central solenoid. So, a challenge is to explore uh, operation solenoid free both startup and, and operation. And that's one point that one thing that we are doing now uh, on, on ST40 and uh, on, uh, uh, on MAST as well. And the space is even more reduced when you think that uh, you need to shield the, uh, the coils uh, in the case of a, a very strong uh, a neutron production. So the shield uh, will take away further, further space. So you see that uh, uh, making a compact uh, Tokamak, uh, uh, which hosts a burning plasma, is uh, is uh, maybe one of the biggest uh, challenges, engineering challenges. And the breeding blanket is also uh, tritium breeding is uh, 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 also a challenge uh, for for a spherical tokamak as it is for uh, for uh, uh, conventional tokamaks as well. Now let me go. Uh, I have a few more uh, minutes. Uh, so let me go to the uh, high temperature superconductors, uh, which uh, is uh, uh, one of the main um, research done at Tokamak Energy. So what does it mean high temperature superconductors? So this table uh, shows you uh, the time evolution of uh, superconductors uh, and, uh, and the critical temperature uh, at which they uh, lose uh, the superconductivity. Uh, and so the, the temperature at which they can below which they should operate, and you see that uh, two uh, two main uh, discoveries have been changing the the scenario of uh, um, superconductors, uh, and are this uh, superconductor based on uh, uh, copper, copper, oxygen, and uh, um, barium, for example, barium, copper, and oxygen. And some other superconductor based on uh, iron and uh, uh, selenium, and these are uh, operating at uh, temperatures uh, uh, of the order of the liquid nitrogen. So you see that uh, uh, being able to operate at higher temperatures than uh, conventional uh, superconductors uh, it might it will represent a very big uh, uh, improvement in terms of costs. Uh, and uh, operability, you don't need to have a huge amount of uh, liquid helium to cool uh, your uh, superconductor as, in, as is done in, in ITER or in JT60SA. If you can operate at the liquid nitrogen temperature, things get so much uh, uh, cheaper. That's why people started uh, in the 1990, uh, late end of 1990s, beginning of uh, uh, 2000, to look at uh, the possibility of applying high temperature superconductors to, uh, to, to tokamaks. Uh, the, one of the big problems with the high temperature superconductors or superconductors in general is that they lose uh, their uh, uh, superconductivity, the property of being superconductor, if you increase the field above a certain, uh, the field that uh, um, uh, is applied to their surface uh, above a certain uh, critical, critical field. Uh, so you can imagine that uh, if you build a, a superconducting coil for a, for a tokamak, uh, you will end up with pretty high magnetic fields on uh, on the in some of the on some of the areas uh, of the of the coils. So the problem of uh, keeping the the, the conductor superconducting uh, it's a very important one. And you see that uh, with the new so whereas, uh, uh, you know, like uh, conventional superconductors, uh, niobium, titanium, the, the critical field uh, is around 10 Tesla, uh, with, the, with the, um, what we call REDCO, the rare earth 
uh, boron, uh, copper, oxygen superconductors, the critical field is uh, much, much higher. And so this is our uh, uh, laboratory where we do uh, the, the development of the super high temperature superconducting uh, coils. Uh, here you see that the, co the, the superconductor come in thin films and this is where we wind, uh, wind the coils. These are some testing apparatus that we have. Um, we did several things. For example, uh, uh, we did quality assessment of the co of the of the of the coil we built this uh, uh, testing uh, coil and we saw show that uh, uh, we could operate uh, at 30 uh, kelvin uh, with a field over uh, 12 tesla and we did multiple fast and slow current ramps to quench the coils and there was no uh, no damage at all so the strategy that we are using for the 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 um, development of uh, um, of these uh, superconducting coils uh, for uh, spherical tokamaks uh, is the following. We have already started, uh, this, this is done. We have looked at the non-insulated uh, high temp temperature superconducting coils. We made these pancakes like this, and we studied the properties of the, of the coil in terms of uh, critical current, critical field, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, then we, we moved to partial insulated uh, coils. We built this uh, demo two. Um, device which is uh, uh, has been uh, has been tested, uh, energized, uh, and uh, uh, and the next uh, and uh, and the next step is to use uh, what we have learned from these two previous steps uh, to build uh, uh, what we call demo four, which will be uh, operational in the uh, quarter four of 2021, the last quarter of 2021. And in demo four, we will basically use the technology uh, developed for this uh, uh, field superconductor uh, coils to assemble a device which is basically a spherical tokamak, purely made of uh, of, of these coils, and we will operate and uh, operate it at the same uh, current uh, and field of, of uh, the spherical tokamak. Uh, the only thing that will not be in uh, demo four is is a plasma because we sem we separated the research in terms of uh, in terms of uh, plasma physics and uh, um, high temperature superconductor. So this will be an elect uh, an electric machine, a fully superconducting electric machine. Uh, okay, so uh, there are there are, there is here some information about. Uh, uh, what we have observed uh, uh, for these pancakes, uh, it was run uh, uh, at a temperature of 20 Kelvin uh, for many, many hours. You see, we have been uh, operating for uh, uh, more than 12 hours. And the peak uh, magnetic field that was obtained on the coil uh, was uh, of 24 Tesla. So this is quite uh, Quite large compared to if you if you remember the, the plot that I've shown you uh, before at 21 uh, Kelvin. Okay, so this is just to show you the the uh, the instrumentation that is used for the coil winding and for the coil testing, and I think uh, uh, the last slide uh, is about the demo four. I think it's a very very nice. This is the electric uh, uh, machine that we are uh, building and will be operational uh, by uh, the end of, uh, uh, let's say, last quarter of 2021. So demo four has a 25 centimeter uh, uh, major radius uh, and operates at 10 Tesla uh, at uh, 25 centimeter radius. So 10 Tesla will be here, and you can imagine that the, the magnetic field on the on the coil will be so much uh, larger than 10 Tesla. So it will actually exceed the 20 Tesla on the center cone. So this will be a demonstration and we can hold the, the temperature superconductor properties uh, for, a long, for a long period of time uh, with a 20 Tesla uh, field on the, on the center column. Um, it will operate at 20 Kelvin and there will be 20 megajoules stored energy. So basically the, we will demonstrate scalable quench protection and we will also test the polar field and polar field interaction. So, and we run simulation of fusion pulse heat loads. 
And the last thing that we will need to do is once this is uh, done, we will have to combine uh, this technology with the with the ST40 spherical tokamak in a, in a fully super high temperature superconducting device that will produce fusion power. Okay, so I will stop now with the. Uh, uh, this slide, and uh, I would take uh, uh, questions before we go for the uh, little break. Perfect. So, there are questions outside. Please uh, hand your uh, hand. So let me see. Uh, one question, sorry. Bye, Simone. Uh, how do you simulate the its load in a demo program? How do you simulate the heat loads uh, in demo form? It will be simulated with uh, um, uh, with uh, uh, we, we will not have uh, plasmas, uh, but it will be simulated with uh, um, heaters, basically. So we will have some uh, non-superconductors uh, resistors uh, that will uh, uh, bring up the temperature in certain parts of the of the of the device of the device. So we have. Uh, is dedicated to just heat. This is the same way you basically bake a, a, a conventional tokamak. So we will uh, use the same techniques to increase the temperature. It, it, yeah. Okay, thank you. Other question? Um. Uh, hello, um, many thanks uh, for uh, the very nice uh, presentation, first of all. Um, I would like to ask, you intend to operate at 20K, but uh, are you uh, then uh, going to use uh, any way helium, I assume, or uh, a different uh, coolant? Okay, so... Um... We will use uh, uh, we, we will we will use uh, nitro liquid nitrogen for uh, uh, for this, uh, and we will uh, minimize uh, let's say the use of uh, uh, liquid helium because the demonstration uh, uh, that we want to make is that uh, we can uh, operate without uh, large quantities of uh, liquid helium, which is what is used in uh, uh, let's say uh, conventional. Um, superconductors. Uh, yes, I imagine, but uh, as you well know, uh, when you use, uh, when you go at high temperature, I mean uh, the temperature so liquid hydro, uh, nitrogen, of course, uh, the critical current density uh, uh, is uh, very low for uh, even for uh, the high temperature superconductors. So at the end, uh, if you operate at 20k, I'm wondering uh, which is uh, yes. the advantage uh, in uh, using uh, more uh, uh, superconductor than at uh, 4.2k. At, uh, at the same time, uh, you are more or less obliged to use a uh, part of, of uh, helium unless you want to use a uh, uh, hydrogen. So uh, this was basically my question. Anyway, partially uh, nitrogen, partially uh, helium to achieve a 20k, if I understand. Yes, this is uh, okay. So let, let me tell you a uh, very important, uh, very important point that uh, uh, the, the way we operate is uh, um, there is a, a, a bit of a separation between the uh, superconducting uh, research uh, and uh, and uh, tokamak research uh, within tokamak energy. Uh, so I, uh, as a, as a physicist that works on the on the uh, spherical tokamak side rather than on the superconducting side, uh, I kind of know what uh, uh, what I'm told. So I'm not sure whether uh, uh, whether uh, uh, hydrogen will be used uh, rather than uh, than than helium to avoid. Having to use uh, uh, to use uh, helium, so that's that's probably a possibility, but I'm not uh, I'm not hundred percent sure. Okay, thank you. Michele, abbiamo, there is another question from Claudio Carati and then Cristina Mazzotta. 
but then uh, there are the last two because then we have a break. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I just make. I have several questions, but I will just make one. Um, it's still, uh, again, on the on the on the magnets. Um, do, are you planning to make testings of the magnets? It's, it's, since the mag the, the, the machine is so compact, uh, are you planning to take to do some tests on uh, neutron irradiation on the magnet, especially yes. especially on the on the low fields or the high field side? Yes. Yes, we will definitely make uh, tests uh, with the. Uh, neutron irradiation. I mean, once we have demo 4, uh, this device built, uh, this will be, uh, we will be uh, testing both uh, heat loads uh, and neutron irradiation to see how much uh, the neutron uh, damage will uh, impact on the uh, superconducting properties and everything. We'll be fully characterizing uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, these uh, coils uh, in the, as close as possible an environment that reminds uh, uh, the a burning plasma environment. Of course, we will never be able to uh, to test in fully. The, the final test will be when we have a burning plasma inside uh, this device. But uh, we will we will put sources of uh, neutrons, uh, etc., to to test to test that. Yes. Thank you, Christina. Uh, thank you, Michele, for your presentation. Very clear. Uh, my question regards uh, the, the physics goal that you think uh, to obtain in the, fur in the next uh, experimental camping. So can you focus this about what uh, you expected to obtain in the physics goal of the machine? Yes, so the, the first thing, in, as you will see in the next presentation, I will focus more on, on ST40. Uh, and, and, and the physics of ST40 itself. Uh, but uh, uh, I can tell you immediately that, uh, first of all, we want to show uh, high performances in ST40. As you know, spherical tokamak have been operating at the low magnetic field and have achieved and have not achieved the same temperatures and the NT tau of, uh, let's say, uh, conventional tokamaks yet. So by op uh, ST40 will operate uh, at uh, 3 tesla. Uh, with a maximum um, uh, current of uh, two megaamps, so that will be in the same kind of plasma parameters of uh, of jet on a smaller on a smaller plasma. So we want to demonstrate that we can get uh, um, a, a ten kilo ten keV uh, temperature uh, in the in this device, and uh, a, a very large uh, a large pressure, large beta. So we want to push. Uh, uh, the boundaries of uh, spherical tokamaks uh, uh, using a high field, uh, a high field spherical tokamak, and then we will check uh, the beta limit. Uh, we will check the confinement uh, at high magnetic field in in spherical tokamak, and so on. So to build uh, uh, a basis uh, knowledge on uh, uh, performing uh, uh, high performance spherical tokamak to be able to uh, get more. Uh, how to say certainty in the design of the uh, fusion module, which is be based on a spherical tokamak. Okay, thank you. I, I'll, I'll uh, say much more later. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michele, we can stop for uh, five minutes and then we will uh, restart. Okay. Okay. In five minutes. Okay, so um, the second part. Uh, of this lecture is focused uh, on ST40. I will give you uh, some details uh, of the tokamak and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, operation, program, plans, uh, etc. So ST40. First of all, let me say two words about uh, uh, tokamak energy. So tokamak energy is a private company that was uh, established in uh, 2009. And the mission uh, uh, of the private company in 2009, uh, here it says uh, uh, the mission was to develop a faster way to fusion energy. Uh, and the way to develop a faster way to fusion energy goes through uh, improvement in the technology, basically. Uh, so the idea of using uh, high temperature superconductors uh, to make uh, um, uh, the coils of a tokamak uh, and to make a, a more compact. There are two ideas here. One, to make a compact device uh, to avoid uh, all the uh, issues and problems of building a, a very large uh, 
a device that takes uh, a long time to be built. And the other one is uh, with a eye to the cost. So basically uh, making uh, uh, low temperature uh, uh, superconducting coils should uh, reduce uh, the cost of operating a device. So that was the idea behind the uh, funding uh, to uh, Tokamak Energy in 2009. It's privately funded and uh, it's a spin out from CCSD, from the Callum Center for Fusion Energy. So those who funded Tokamak Energy were uh, uh, previously uh, working at, uh, at CCFT. That's why the line of spherical tokamak, because that was the line uh, of research of the CCFT in uh, 2009 with uh, uh, first start uh, and then uh, and then mast. Uh, the, the, the engineering center of uh, tokamak energy is uh, in Milton Park, Oxfordshire, which is uh, maybe yeah. 20 minutes yeah, from uh, yeah. from the column site from where jet is so it's not uh, it's not very far uh, and uh, um, and the team of uh, people working at uh, tokamak energy is about uh, 150 uh, scientists and engineers uh, tokamak energy since 2009 has built and tested the three working tokamak uh, prototypes uh, since the, actually 2012. Uh, one of such uh, working tokamak uh, uh, prototype is uh, ST25, uh, which is now um, at uh, DTU in Denmark, uh, and uh, they uh, renamed it uh, North, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and tokamak Energy as a world leading superconducting magnet laboratory, as, uh, as you have seen. Uh, uh, in the previous presentation. Here you see uh, some pictures uh, of uh, ST25. Uh, and also you see some picture of this uh, very nice uh, prototype that was run uh, for uh, uh, high temperature superconducting magnets uh, uh, for a very long time. Uh, these are, uh, um, I think these are hours. Uh, so this was continuously run for uh, such a long, uh, such a long time at the low current, etc. So the approach of uh, uh, tokamak energy is what I was telling you before to separate uh, the research on uh, um, high temperature superconductors, uh, which will need to operate at high current and high field, and the research on uh, spherical tokamaks. Uh, that's why we have uh, ST40 for pursuing uh, uh, the research on the physics of spherical tokamaks, while uh, half of the company is uh, concentrating on uh, on the um, development of the uh, coils made uh, with high temperature superconductors. And the idea is that once these two uh, technologies uh, are uh, ready, we put them together and we build uh, uh, a prototype uh, of uh, uh, fusion module. Um, and the idea is that this will allow us to build something which is smaller than uh, uh, the conventional tokamaks uh, and uh, hopefully cheaper and on a faster time scale. Okay. So, sorry, I have to move my, my, um, uh, my zoom screen. Pictures here down so that I can see what is uh, on the slide. So we have uh, uh, basing uh, uh, the approach on the, what we call modular fusion. We want to exploit uh, uh, the uh, improved performance of uh, spherical tokamaks uh, and use a high temperature superconductor uh, to build the much more compact uh, uh, mo uh, fusion modules. Uh, the idea is that we will not build, uh, you know, um, uh, like like demo where uh, uh, a lot of uh, power will be produced, but we will be uh, building uh, smaller modules which produce uh, uh, less uh, uh, less power, fusion power of the order of uh, uh, 250, say, uh, megawatts uh, or 300, 650 megawatts thermal equivalent. 
and possibly we will have many many of those to make a, a power station so not a single huge device but many uh, smaller uh, fusion modules that can be uh, assembled together like uh, like you do with batteries okay so the approach to fusion sees different uh, different scales so we put here uh, different tokamaks uh, on the uh, x-axis is the major radius of the plasma um, as i said uh, in my previous presentation in uh, uh, in conventional tokamaks uh, the major radius of the plasma very often uh, coincides with the major radius of the device uh, of the vacuum vessel in spherical tokamaks this is not the case but uh, you see uh, how our design for the compact uh, uh, fusion module uh, which we call ste1 for energy uh, production um, has a, a plasma major radius of uh, about two meters and uh, uh, the design of uh, our uh, friends from uh, um, uh, from mit uh, which are also trying to use high temperature superconductors for uh, uh, for a compact uh, tokamak, but conventional tokamak. Uh, their design arc um, is uh, is a device of uh, of three meter, three meters, so more or less like uh, uh, like jet. So if you compare uh, um, if you compare STE one with uh, with jet. Uh, it's uh, more compact uh, in terms of uh, uh, major radius, uh, at least uh, for what uh, concerns the plasma, but it's more elong elongated. The elongation is similar to the elongation to the to the, the let's say of, of ether, if you want the 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 height of the plasma. Again, uh, uh, some information about the difference between. Uh, it's a nice picture between uh, uh, the conventional tokamak and spherical tokamak. We will operate, uh, we are operating at an aspect ratio less than two uh, and an elongation uh, larger than two. So spherical tokamak plasma, it's much taller than, uh, than a conventional tokamak plasma. It's much more elongated uh, and the plasma has a, a, a more reduced uh, aspect ratio. On the side of the benefits, uh, as uh, I'm kind of repeating uh, some some of the things I've said uh, I've said before, but I want to just summarize what are the benefits of uh, of uh, pursuing uh, uh, this line of compact spherical tokamak rather than conventional tokamak. There is uh, the natural elongation of a spherical tokamak. You see here uh, the plasma elongation for the natural elongation of a uh, uh, plasma at aspect ratio 2.5 and a uh, plasma uh, at aspect ratio uh, 1.2 so you see that uh, the uh, naturally the plasma gets uh, more elongated and we can operate at a higher beta which is economically uh, important because uh, we can get more pressure for our for what uh, for the for the magnetic field that we pay for and again, the demonstration that we can operate at higher beta is uh, is here. Uh, the the results from start, where you can see that uh, start was achieving uh, a beta normalized of six, well above the Troyon limit uh, of, of a conventional tokamak, which is uh, three point five. On the pluses, there is still also the the boost of current. Uh, the fraction of bootstrap current uh, uh, is is, uh, is larger in the spherical tokamak uh, than in uh, in conventional tokamaks, and so spherical tokamak can simu simultaneously have a high uh, bootstrap fraction and high toroidal beta. And this is to remind you that uh, uh, also the confinement. Uh, in a spherical tokamak is uh, uh, expected to be uh, better than uh, uh, than in a conventional tokamak. Uh, again, this is based on the results, uh, on the limited results that uh, are available at the moment. But one of the uh, one of the points of uh, ST40 is that of exploring uh, really this uh, um, uh, this scaling with magnetic field, 
uh, that is predicted uh, uh, using the NST, the data from uh, uh, from NSTX and and MAST. So you see here that uh, um, the triple product NT tau, which is required for ignition, can be written as a beta B square tau. And so if you raise beta rather than B and uh, tau, you can have a, uh, uh, you can have a more attractive solution. Uh, rather than increasing uh, tau, typically increasing tau would mean uh, uh, increasing the size. And B is also, uh, if you increase only B, uh, it could be expensive. This is the solution uh, of, uh, uh, let's say, MIT to go to much higher uh, magnetic field, 12 Tesla for uh, Spark. Uh, we want to operate around the 4 Tesla, so keeping B lower, but we want to operate a much higher, a much higher beta. So this is the outline of this second lecture. I will tell you about the ST40 plasma parameters. I will talk about how we actually start a plasma in, uh, in ST40 using merging compression, which is a technique that was developed uh, at Calum on, uh, on the start, Tokamak. Then I will uh, discuss the double null plasma equilibrium that we hope that, that we um, are going to achieve uh, in ST40 in the, uh, in, the, in the present campaign. I'll show you some modeling that we've done for plasma performance, performances, the simulation of the scape of layer conditions, and the, some of the BDE studies that we are doing in collaboration with uh, uh, the University of Tusha. So here is a nice picture of ST40. Uh, I have to say that uh, uh, when I joined this, uh, Tokamak Energy, uh, it was uh, possible to see uh, ST40 uh, from this viewing gallery, uh, and uh, uh, it was operated like this without any any shield uh, uh, outside. But then, uh, in the last uh, shutdown, a bio shield has been installed. So basically, a concrete box has been installed around uh, around ST40. So if you, if you come now to visit uh, uh, Tokamak Energy, you will not be able to. Uh, to see ST40 uh, like, like this, you will have to enter this bio shield uh, in, inside. So it's no longer visible from the viewing, uh, from the viewing gallery. Uh, and this is because uh, um, we were producing uh, a lot of uh, uh, more, more, uh, more uh, radiation than uh, uh, expected uh, uh, before, uh, before the bio shield was designed. So, so the, the bio shield is. Uh, Allowing us to go to higher performances uh, without uh, um, without uh, breaking any any law. <laughs> so, um, so the ST40 uh, is a high field spherical tokamak. High field uh, means, uh, uh, in terms of uh, spherical tokamak, say so if I remind you, like MAST had a magnetic field of 0.6 Tesla. And the same sort of magnetic field uh, had the NSTX uh, started even a lower magnetic field. So spherical tokamaks historically have been operated at low field because of the high beta uh, property. So you could have a, a high pressure with low field. So people started to build the tokamaks at, uh, at lowish field. Uh, but uh, uh, ST40 is pushing uh, the boundary and is now operating at uh, 3 Tesla, which is considered a high field for a spherical tokamak, and is uh, uh, basically the same magnetic field of uh, jet. Uh, the plasma or JT60SA, I compare ST40 with jet and JT60SA because the plasma, uh, the magnetic field is similar. The plasma current is uh, 2 mega amps. Which is also consistent with the uh, uh, jet, typical jet plasma current. I know jet can go to much higher plasma, to higher plasma current, but uh, uh, it's not uh, rare to see jet plasma with three Tesla and two megaamps. The major radius uh, is uh, uh, much smaller than uh, uh, than uh, uh, conventional tokamak uh, uh, is. Uh, uh, around uh, between 0.4 and 0.6 meters, because we can vary the major radius of the plasma inside the, the vacuum vessel. The aspect ratio uh, can be varied as well between uh, 1.6 and 1.8. You remember that uh, spherical tokamaks have an aspect ratio of less than, than 2. 
So operating ST40 will allow us also to scan in aspect ratio and check, for example, the scaling of confinement with aspect ratio and, and uh, extend the database of the, con the confinement database at the, this uh, uh, low values of aspect ratio and these high values of magnetic field. We can assess uh, extended elongation from uh, 2.5 to 3, so we can make quite elongated uh, plasmas. The main uh, aims of the research is to demonstrate, uh, uh, first of all, improved confinement uh, in, a, in a high field spherical tokamak. Although uh, beta was uh, uh, high in start or uh, mast and so on, the confinement, uh, uh, the confinement time was not uh, uh, very long. And this is due to the, to the, to the, to the low magnetic field. So we hope to demonstrate uh, with the uh, ST40 that going to at high magnetic field, we can, uh, we can achieve uh, confinement time similar to or larger than uh, con conventional tokamaks uh, of the same, same size. Then we want to demonstrate uh, uh, high beta performances um, in line with what, uh, uh, what I was saying uh, uh, before. And the most very importantly, we want to also show that we can operate non-inductively. So non-inductive operation means that we can basically switch off the, the, the central solenoid. ST40 has a central solenoid. Um, so when we operate non-inductive, we can switch off the central solenoid and sustain the current via booster current or via other means, uh, like uh, uh, NBI-driven current or uh, RF-driven current. So we will be developing uh, solenoid-free startup methods uh, using uh, uh, ECRH, which is the main radio frequency system that will be installed on, uh, on ST40. And we will be characterizing the vertical performance uh, and develop reactor-relevant operating scenarios. All this uh, will be in support uh, uh, of the design of, of the um, STE1, which is the compact uh, uh, fusion module uh, that I was showing it in the previous slides, the two meter device that we will be designing, uh, uh, taking, uh, uh, merging the high temperature superconductor technology and the uh, advancements in the understanding of the physics that we will be doing here on, on ST40. Right, here is a picture of how ST40 looks like uh, from, uh, uh, from the inside. You see here the, the, the toroidal uh, field coils that meet in the middle. Um, there are two vacuum chamber, chambers. There is an inner vacuum chamber, which is this, this one here, where the plasma uh, is uh, generated. And there is an outer vacuum chamber, uh, which is outside the, uh, outside the, the, um, the toroidal field coils. And uh, uh, there is a central solenoid here, which allows to drive uh, the plasma current. Uh, but the central solenoid is not the only uh, drive of the plasma current. We have here these coils, which is called the merging compression coils. And that's the, uh, the coils that are used to generate the plasma and to start the plasma. I will show you later. The plasma starts uh, around these two coils. Then uh, it utilizes uh, uh, magnetic reconnection to uh, uh, generate then a toroidal current uh, detached from the coil, which will then be moved towards the central limiter post. Uh, and then there are uh, uh, diverter coils. Here at the bottom of the end at the top for the double null configuration and poloidal for, coils for the plasma control equilibrium etc. Again the parameters are reported uh, here um, and uh, uh, and this this is uh, uh, yes uh, the, there is also two megawatt of uh, auxiliary heating which is uh, basically NBI. Uh, plus uh, ECRH. We have uh, two uh, neutral beam injectors. Uh, one uh, is uh, uh, kindly provided by uh, RFX Padova, and the ECRH uh, uh, gyrotrons are uh, being uh, 
um, uh, acquired and will be installed later later this year. The NBI injectors are already available and uh, can be used uh, uh, immediately. The flat top uh, current at the moment uh, at three Tesla is uh, uh, of around one second. And here you see some more images of the um, central uh, solenoid, the, 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 the um, assembly of ST40, and the control room, which is what, uh, what is in my background, the control room uh, of uh, ST40. And here uh, you see how it looks like once uh, it's all, uh, all assembled. Okay, a little bit of comparison between ST40 and other spherical tokamaks. Uh, these are all new spherical tokamaks. A must upgrade is just starting now. Uh, there are first operation and, and STXU has not started yet. Uh, we are waiting for it to become live. Uh, but you see, you can compare the, uh, the uh, aspect ratio, the geometry, the major radius, uh, and uh, uh, and the aspect ratio. So you see that ST40 is the smallest of the three. Uh, the aspect ratio uh, it's in the range 1.6, 1.8, but ST40 has the largest magnetic field. You see that an STX will have one Tesla. Must still has a, a magnetic field that is below one Tesla. So ST40 will really push the boundary of uh, uh, spherical top magnetic field in in spherical tokamak that's why we call it uh, I, I, I field spherical tokamak the plasma current is uh, similar in the three devices to two megaamps and the heating is uh, um, less uh, four megawatts in uh, the total heating power will be four, four megawatts in uh, um, st40 compared to the 12 megawatts in must you and stx uh, but you have to consider that uh, ST40 plasma will be uh, smaller than mass 2 and STXU plasmas, and this four, four megawatts uh, will produce um, uh, quite a large uh, power density in, uh, in, uh, in the small volume of uh, the ST40 plasma. So, okay. We have a, a set of the diagnostics around, uh, around ST40. So here you see that uh, we have a diagnostic uh, neutral beam injector for uh, the measurement of uh, uh, the, uh, the ion temperature. We have uh, UV visible Doppler spectrometers. We have soft X-ray spectrometers. We have soft X-ray linear arrays and cameras for uh, tomography. Uh, we have uh, more spectrometers, line emission monitors. We have measurements of hard X-ray and gamma detectors. We have the fast visible and age alpha cameras, infrared cameras. We have an NPA, neutral particle analyzer. And also we have some diagnostics which are isolated from, uh, from vib for vibration and we have an interferometer and radiometer. Uh, to this set of diagnostics, we are now uh, acquiring uh, uh, a Thomson scattering uh, diagnostic for the measurement of the electron uh, density and temperature profiles. Uh, and this is uh, built in collaboration with uh, uh, Princeton. Princeton PPPL is one of our uh, largest uh, collaboration that we have uh, with uh, uh, external laboratories. Okay, so here, here is uh, the, the technique used for starting the plasma. Uh, which is called the merging compression. You remember the two coils that I was uh, mentioning before. The plasma is uh, generated around the, the merging compression coils and then is uh, uh, pushed. Uh, the two blobs of plasma are pushed, one by, made it grow. You have an X point of the magnetic field and this X point, uh, once uh, uh, the condition are uh, the right condition, uh, will under, undergo uh, magnetic recognition. And once you have magnetic recognition, the energy in the magnetic field will be transferred uh, to the plasma, will be uh, uh, changed into thermal energy. So the, the reason why this is an interesting way of starting the plasma 
is that uh, you end up uh, already in the very early phases uh, with a plasma which has a temperature of, of uh, 1 kV at a very low current, thanks to the, to the heating due to the magnetic recognition. And here is a, is a video that shows uh, how this uh, uh, looks like. So you can follow the plasma current on the bottom, on the right hand side at the bottom, and uh, you can see the, uh, the plasma forming in the vessel. And on the left hand side is the magnetic reconstruction uh, of this plasma. So that's how uh, the ST40 plasma uh, starts. And that's how it ends. Okay. Okay. So this is an example of another another example of a of a plasma in uh, in ST40. Where, uh, it's a it's a limiter plasma. So this was. Uh, these two examples are from uh, uh, the previous campaign before the installation of the uh, of the diverter in ST40. So all plasmas in the previous campaign were uh, uh, limiter uh, uh, limiter plasmas, and uh, um, so just uh, two words about the material that uh, is in the in the machine. So the the limiter, which is the this vertical tiles there are in carbon uh, and now we have installed uh, a diverter which is in uh, uh, covered uh, uh, targets covered in uh, molybdenum so we have both carbon and molybdenum in the in the in the vessel this is another example of a, a, a recent plasma from last week uh, where uh, uh, where you see uh, the plasma current and uh, the Magnetic reconstruction and the 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 the, the view from the uh, visible camera, and then these are the time traces of the uh, main plasma plasma parameters. Uh, okay, so we are in the restart phase. So we are at the moment uh, achieving uh, currents of uh, 500 kiloamps, which will be ramped up uh, to flat tops of uh, one megaamps, and then later on. To the nominal uh, two megaamps. So, in order uh, to move from uh, limiter plasmas, which is what we have seen in, in now in the, in the in the visible camera view, to double null uh, configuration, uh, we had to uh, install and design and install uh, uh, an upper and lower diverter, which is what what you see here. So, this uh, these plates were designed and installed during the last uh, shutdown that lasted uh, uh, for, a, for a, approximately uh, a year. Uh, this was not the only thing that was done during the shutdown. One of the biggest uh, uh, constructions during the, the last shutdown was the installation of the BioShield that allows us to, um, to run at high, 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 uh, high performance. So here is a picture of the um, the diverter uh, plates. So you see they are uh, attached uh, at the bottom and at the top of the central post. And these are the tiles uh, which are tilted uh, to avoid uh, shine, to avoid the loads. Uh, uh, so they are aligned with the magnetic field. Uh, and uh, uh, these are simulations that show uh, the the two strike points. Uh, uh, in uh, and the, uh, the temperature of the strike points uh, on the targets. You see here, this is the uh, inner strike point, and this is the outer strike point of the plasma, inner here and outer uh, there. Okay, oops, a few nice pictures of plasmas. And this is how the, the diverter uh, looks like now with the installed diverter targets. You can see them here. So here in these pictures, you can see clearly the, the limiter, the limiters and the diverter targets and the various ports. 
So this is how the um, double null uh, plasma will look like, configuration will look like. These are the equilibrium reconstruction uh, done with the, uh, our uh, equilibrium reconstruction codes. And you see that both strike points will, uh, will be on, uh, on this um, vertical target. We have plans uh, for, uh, um, let's say, next year, uh, um, after we complete uh, this uh, uh, present campaign, for the installation of a new uh, vacuum vessel uh, in configuration, which will extend the diverter targets to have also a horizontal target here. And uh, uh, in that, that will allow us also to uh, push the plasma a little bit further to the to the right and move the outer strike point uh, further to the right, as it is shown in this uh, um, uh, in this equilibrium reconstruction for the uh, new uh, diverter configuration. So we are at the moment we are working on designing uh, this new diverter configuration, and this will be uh, installed the next year. Uh, this will also bring uh, along uh, um, uh, additional diverter coils, uh, as you can see at the top here, which are not uh, uh, present at the moment. So next year, during the new shutdown, we will install new diverter coils and will allow us to explore also uh, further uh, diverter configurations. These are the predicted performance, let's say, uh, for uh, some simulation that shows some predicted performance for, the, for this present campaign. Of, uh, of ST40. So we are looking now to perform plasmas uh, at uh, one megaamps uh, with a beta poloidal of uh, 0.32. And uh, we will be operating uh, almost uh, at the nominal field, 2.67 Tesla. This is the plasma volume uh, above uh, one meter cube. And Z effective has been uh, uh, assumed to be uh, 1.5. Uh, we have uh, a beam power deposited uh, very central in our uh, in our discharges uh, due to the reduced uh, radius of the of the device uh, we've done simulations uh, with uh, with astra for the performance of uh, of st40 and we used the uh, uh, new beam uh, inside astra for the calculation of the power deposition from the two uh, beam injectors uh, and also we benchmarked it with uh, with ASCOT, which is a, a full orbit uh, Monte Carlo code. And you see that we should be able to achieve uh, uh, temperatures, uh, ion temperatures uh, uh, of around seven kilo electron volt and electron temperature of around uh, uh, four kilo electron volt. Uh, sim we have done several simulations with different assumptions for the age mode pedestal for the transport uh, in this case uh, we um, we defined uh, uh, the electron uh, the external transport value with uh, based on the thermal ion poloidal thermal radius uh, and we use the same transport setting of uh, one of the actual mass discharges uh, including 1.6 megawatt nbi and we consistently find uh, um, and in, 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 we consistently find uh, temperatures uh, 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 of this uh, of this kind of level. So we expect that we will be able to achieve uh, these high performances. The, ele the uh, electron density looks quite uh, peaked, and the reason for the peaked electron density is that we have uh, um, the uh, peaked power and particle deposition from the from the from the beam. So the beam will fuel, uh, uh, centrally fuel the, the plasma, and uh, it will uh, uh, it will uh, lead to uh, to um, very peak the density profiles. For the pedestal modeling, we have used uh, uh, we rely on our collaboration with the, with the Princeton PVPL and STX. And we use the scaling that was found uh, on uh, NSTX by looking at the NSTX database. Uh, plus, we have done some pedestal stability analysis. So in NSTX, it was found that uh, uh, the pedestal width scales uh, with beta poloidal only. So it's different than uh, the scaling that is observed on conventional tokamaks. Huh? So there is a stronger scaling with beta poloidal. And, uh, uh, 
this results is published in this nuclear fusion paper by Ahmed Diallo. So we use the same scaling in our simulations. Another interesting uh, uh, result that we found uh, in modeling uh, uh, ST40 plasma is that uh, uh, we uh, found that when you do um, gelokinetic analysis, uh, you observe that uh, by increasing the magnetic field, the um, let's say nonlinear or quasi-linear uh, conductivity that you expect to find uh, in in your plasma drops quite a lot. So let me explain what th this graph is. On the x-axis is the intensity of the magnetic field, and on the y-axis is the, um, say, high ion conductivity calculated as gamma over k square, which is typically called uh, <coughs> mixing length diffusivity. And you see that uh, uh, when you go from uh, below one tesla to above one tesla, there is a big jump in the term, in the uh, in the conductivity, which would indicate that. Uh, at high field, uh, we should be seeing uh, uh, a much improved, uh, uh, much improved confinement. Uh, so this is, this remains to be uh, to be seen in the experiments. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are also doing um, um, many more uh, gyrokinetic simulations. Uh, but all of them show that uh, we should be able to see uh, improvement uh, uh, of confinement compared to conventional tokamaks. The other uh, uh, important point uh, is on plasma stability. We will have to work quite a lot on uh, keeping this plasma stable because, uh, uh, as you know, uh, elongation can lead to uh, a stable, uh, stable mode. So this is an analysis done on a simulated scenario of, uh, of ST40 with uh, uh, the, the MHD code called Kings. And here is uh, uh, in, in orange, is the time evolution of the elongation of the plasma. So you see here in time, the plasma become more and more elongated. And at this time, the, uh, the, the growth rate of the external M equal one mode, N equal zero mode, M equal one, N equal zero mode becomes uh, pretty large and uh, uh, requires uh, uh, stabilization. So we are preparing uh, for the challenge. Uh, here is uh, the, uh, uh, the the field calculated the displacement field uh, of the um, of the example of the previous slide, where you see that the more uh, the more elongated the uh, the plasma, the more the growth rate of this uh, n equal one n equal zero mode becomes large. So we have to uh, stabilize this, and it's interesting that uh, the both the um, uh, merging compression coils and the, the, uh, these shoulders here act as a stabilizing uh, plates because it's important to notice that the plasma is quite far from the wall. So the, the effect of the wall, on, uh, the stabilizing effect of the wall is less uh, uh, important uh, than the effect of the stabilizing effect of these uh, coils, which are much, uh, these two coils and these uh, structures that are closer to the, to the plasma. Okay, let me show you now uh, an exam example of a, a workflow that we're building for the optimization of the diverter configuration. As I told you, we are uh, designing a new configuration of the diverter for the next uh, uh, shutdown. And so we are doing that by using uh, an optimization uh, workflow which couples, uh, uh, which couples the scrape of layer code to a code that projects the power to the to the structure and that's linked to the to the uh, CAD design of the of the vessel and the and the and the targets. So using this workflow, uh, we can change uh, uh, we can change automatically the configuration of the diverter for a given uh, for a given plasma conditions and uh, and run several simulations to maximize. Uh, uh, or to minimize, let's say, uh, the power uh, deposited by changing the uh, changing the angle of the target, uh, and so on. And we are working with this company, Laffy, that is providing us with the framework for uh, for this uh, workflow engine that we are using.
And this is an example of how this, this works. We start from the, the scenario, for example, on uh, an Astra scenario that provides the, the equilibrium. The equilibrium is then reconstructed as a free boundary equilibrium by a free boundary solver. And then uh, uh, the, 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 there is also a scrape of layer uh, simulation that uh, gives us the condition in the scrape of layer and the power is projected to the utilizing this code called Vita. It's calculated uh, and uh, the 3D heat load on the diverter uh, surfaces are, are provided. And then we uh, we loop changing the changing the, the the angles and we try to optimize the structure. Uh, this is a work that uh, is uh, uh, ongoing in collaboration with the University of Tusha. We are looking at uh, uh, still for the next uh, uh, upgrade where we are going to change the inner vessel. We are going to install also uh, pumps in the diverter diverter pumps. And so we have been starting to run a simulation of the scrape of layer, and thanks to Giulio Rubino, uh, where we are looking at the efficacy of the pumps in uh, controlling the density uh, at, the, at the separatrix. And uh, this, uh, uh, and this feeds back directly into the design, design of the pumps. So we found that uh, uh, already, already from the first simulation, we found that the, the pumps uh, uh, that were designed with the, the, the given pumping speed were sufficient to, to control the plasma density at the separatrix. The other work that we are going to do on, uh, on the scrape of layer is that of running experiments and simulations for ST40 uh, um, with, uh, with XGC1 in collaboration with Princeton to establish the scrape of layer width. Uh, first, uh, uh, numerically, let's say, running uh, ST40 simulator, we will add uh, an ST40 point to this plot. Uh, we want to see whether in the simulation we still see deviation from the uh, from the uh, from the Ike scaling. Uh, but then the other point, the other thing is, we will also take measurements uh, and we will investigate uh, uh, experimentally the scrape of layer width uh, uh, in. Uh, uh, in ST40, and we will contribute data to this uh, uh, database. And I think this we are going towards the end. These are the simulations that are done also by uh, University of Tusha on uh, um, vertical uh, displacement of VDEs uh, in uh, in preparation for uh, possible uh, disruptions. As you know, disruptions are. Uh, uh, something that uh, will will uh, will appear. So we have to characterize uh, the forces uh, uh, and the currents that will flow in the vessel uh, uh, during during the disruptions, both uh, uh, in the present configuration and the future configuration. So we are using uh, uh, we are using uh, MaxFair for uh, for these uh, simulations, and uh, and uh, uh, this is done. Uh, and this is presently work work in progress. Okay, I think I finished. Uh, uh... On time, perfect. Thank so, you. Thanks a lot. Uh, please, uh, I would like to thank again uh, Michele for a very nice uh, presentation. Questions from outside? I can see also Flavio is participating. Yes. I arrived late because uh, the, the connection was not possible to achieve before. So constantly I cannot do too many questions. No. Okay. I, I guess, uh, um, uh, Giuseppe, I guess the, the slides will be available. I... Yes. Yeah, OK. Oh, for the students, yes, because we have a dedicated platform uh, where the, where uh, they can uh, extract also the the video, not only the presentation. For other people interested to your talk and uh, presentations, can, they can uh, write down my email and uh, I'll show them uh, the slides. Yes, and then if there are questions uh, uh, later, people can always contact me. You have my contact. Email. 
Two questions, uh, Michele. Yes, uh, Which are the, the, the coils for the toroidal field? Oh, uh, is it the question whether they are uh, superconducting? No, no, where, where are, which are? I don't see them. So here, let me go to this one. So the toroidal field coils on ST40, these are the toroidal field coils. Mm -hmm. You see them, no? Yes. And you see them here very nicely. Mm -hmm. Before before it was NK encased in the in the outer vacuum vessel. Are in this is the, so this is the inner vacuum vessel, and then you see nicely the toroidal field coils, uh, and, and then I mean, after that are, are in copper. Yes. So uh, yeah, as I was explaining uh, uh, at the beginning, we are uh, um, we are having this uh, kind of strategy in which we um, we are developing the high temperature superconductors separately from the physics of the spherical tokamak. So we have a copper device mm -hmm. in which we explore a high field operation in a spherical tokamak. At the same time, we are building a, a high temperature superconducting device to explore the properties of the uh, coils built with high temperature superconductors in, uh, in similar uh, to plasma uh, or condition. Maybe you missed uh, this very nice picture here. Yes, I, I think that the problem missed the, the final part of the first part. Uh, yeah. So we are going to build in this year, uh, as we speak, we are building this uh, device, which is called the Demo 4. This is, uh, uh, we are using uh, the high temperature superconductors to, to uh, build all the coils in, in this device. Uh, but uh, we are not going to have a plasma inside. So this will be an electrical device where we will be testing, um, testing we will be generating uh, 10 Tesla uh, at uh, 50, 25 meters, uh, centimeters radius. And we will uh, uh, try to exceed 20 Tesla on the center column. So to, to test the properties uh, in terms of uh, uh, critical magnetic field and critical temperature, of the high-temperature superconductors. We will operate at 20 Kelvin. Uh, and so this, and then we will try to test, simulate fusion plasma heat loads and uh, neutron, uh, neutron fluxes uh, on, on this to characterize uh, the, uh, the, the, the high-temperature superconducting coils. So this will be done separately from the, uh, from the plasma studies that is done on ST40 at high field, but copper coils. Mm -hmm. OK. And then obviously, the aim is that we will put things together. As soon as we have results from, uh, from both, this will feed into the design of, uh, of uh, a fusion module that will be producing uh, uh, a certain amount of power. I was showing, uh, I think, uh, uh, was it here? Yes. We are, we are aiming at designing uh, uh, what we call STE1, which is an energy production uh, spherical tokamak uh, with, a, with a plasma major radius of around the two, two meters, uh, that's the size, uh, and obviously quite uh, highly elongated. And this will be producing, uh, the idea is that this will be producing uh, a power uh, in terms of uh, megawatt of the order of uh, 250 megawatts, so it's not uh, a huge power production, but the idea is that we want to use uh, several uh, fusion modules. So we want, instead of making a big uh, uh, device which uh, produces uh, uh, gigawatts of fusion power, uh, we want to go for small, uh, uh, small compact tokamaks that produce less, but we can use several of them in a power station. Michele, yes. I think that there is a question from Claudio Ferrati. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I have a bunch of questions actually, but uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, um, what kind of uh, instabilities do you expect to have in the new machine? And what is the, what is the timeline of uh, realization of the of the new of, of SE1. 
Oh, ST1. Okay. Uh, the timeline, I'll answer uh, about the timeline. So our uh, our aim is to have uh, ST1 operating uh, uh, in the uh, at the beginning of the 2030s. So we give ourselves uh, now a few years uh, of uh, uh, testing uh, the physics and we're testing with the ST40 and, uh, and on the superconductor. At the same time, we will start to design uh, STE1. And at that point, uh, the, the, the aim is to have it uh, operational uh, by the beginning of uh, 2030, let's say. So that's, the, that's our goal. Uh, the other question was about uh, instabilities that we expect to have in ST1. Yes, yes, especially with the about Elms modes. Okay. Yes. So, of course, uh, uh, the design of ST1 is uh, at the very early stages, uh, but we are looking at uh, uh, we are looking at different, uh, say, diverter uh, uh, configurations. Uh, at the moment, uh, the vector configuration, because I'm looking at uh, I'm thinking about uh, Elms. Uh, and so how to dissipate uh, the, the heat load uh, from uh, edge localized modes and so on. Uh, obviously, we will try to operate, uh, I can tell you, we will try to operate uh, in an Elm free regime, which might uh, uh, resemble uh, uh, an L mode, if you want, or an I mode, where uh, you have uh, uh, don't have this uh, steep uh, steep pedestal. Uh, so the the keyword is obviously to try to avoid going into a, a regime where where you start to have elms. Uh, otherwise, you will have to handle this uh, this large power, which will be emitted uh, uh, on the on the targets. So we will try to develop these regimes. Okay, thank you. And if I ask, if my, I may ask another question, uh, uh, um, what is the strategy uh, at the moment, if you have one, uh, about the disruption handling, with mitigations or prevention? Oh yes. Uh, well, we are working with uh, uh, with uh, with Tusha. Uh, on this with Giuseppe uh, on, on this. So at the moment uh, we are, uh, at the moment uh, for ST40, we are uh, first of all characterizing the, the forces and so on. But the next step uh, is to try to uh, look at uh, disruption, uh, uh, both avoidance and mitigation. Avoidance, uh, first of all, so to build some uh, uh, disruption detectors if you want. So that we can uh, recognize the event of, uh, uh, of a disruption coming, and we can uh, uh, take action. So disruption avoidance, uh, but also disruption mitigation. We'll be looking at uh, various techniques. So that uh, this is more for STE1 because uh, ST40. We 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 will probably do some tests, but uh, it's not a, a big uh, a big problem there. But for STE1, it would be crucial to. To look at disruption mitigation mechanisms such as uh, uh, massive gas injection or uh, uh, or a shattered pellet uh, injection and so on. At the moment, we are also watching uh, the outside world. What uh, what is uh, uh, coming uh, from uh, from the tests done, for example, a jet with the um, shattered pellet injector uh, to see to see which one is the most effective, and then we will adopt. Uh, uh, and we'll adopt the technology when we build the SD1. Yes, our work is more related to, I mean, in terms of uh, electromagnetic uh, and thermostructural uh, forces. So we can uh, we can characterize if the forces uh, are compatible with the machines. So then I think that there is a, we can uh, answer that there will be a second step with the mitigation and the avoidance. Yeah, if I may, again, I have a final question that you have not been mentioning in this presentation, but maybe it's too early to ask. Uh, what kind of system are you uh, thinking of uh, for the blanket in ST1? Ah. <laughs> yes, uh, I think uh, we, we are, uh, it's really uh, early days. Uh, I mentioned I mentioned here the, the breeding, uh, the breeding blanket as uh, one of the uh, technical challenges. Huh? 
so we are uh, working with uh, um, with several other uh, uh, institutes uh, to look at developing uh, uh, the bleeding blanket uh, uh, technology, uh, but we don't have yet uh, a design uh, for uh, for an efficient, eff effective bleeding blanket at the moment. It's still the early days. I, 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 I don't know if, uh, I don't know Claudio, but I hope that I can uh, say Claudio. Claudio, do you finish with the questions? Yes, thank you very much and thank you for the kind answers. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks a lot uh, Claudio. Uh, I think Claudio is from any uh, company. So I, I have a general comment. I, I, I was very young I mean, when I started to work in the fusion, so I was in the end of the 90s. And then I met Michele, and I was and now it's incredible today that we are discussing and uh, looking at a private company working on fusion. So this one is uh, for me is very, I mean, very impressive. Uh, many thanks, uh, Michele, for this collaboration and for this uh, challenge. Uh, I mean, you are very brave, and also your uh, colleagues are very brave because uh, you are not in a public company anymore. So it's, a, it's, a, it's fantastic for me. And sometimes I think that why Italians didn't, didn't try to have also a, a smart a private company, a startup fusion, but now we have DTT, so we can, uh, <laughs> we can join our forces uh, and strengthen DTT. Uh, but very, I, very congratulations from my side, as I said already. Uh, I mean, uh, to run this challenge uh, as a yeah. private company. Thank you, Giuseppe. Maybe I can add, uh, I was, uh, I joined Togamac Energy last year in, uh, in uh, August. Uh, and pre before that, uh, as Giuseppe said, I was, uh, I've been working at JET, um, uh, MAST, uh, FTU, and uh, Tor Supra, and so many different uh, Tokamaks. And the reason why I joined Tokamak Energy is because I wanted to, uh, you know, to see fusion uh, real, uh, for, for real, uh, producing power, uh, hopefully before I retire. So I thought uh, Tokamak Energy has this, uh, um, as Tokamak Energy has uh, uh, other private companies, uh, I'm sure also Commonwealth Fusion Systems, they have the same drive which is try to bring uh, fusion electricity uh, to to the to the fruition uh, on a on a shorter uh, time scale so instead of looking at 2050 we want to bring this uh, to 2030 and we have uh, uh, in Tokamak Energy had these ideas of uh, uh, making uh, small modular uh, uh, reactors uh, that can be put together uh, as a, as a batteries uh, or smaller power and so on. So they looked uh, all very interesting to me. So I decided to uh, to dedicate my efforts uh, in that direction with the hope that uh, we will really make a uh, fusion electricity a reality uh, sooner than than later. Yes, uh, and uh, my final comment is that uh, this uh, your lecture is inside. The uh, a course uh, that is uh, at the last year our master in uh, mechanical engineer for fusion. So I'm so happy that uh, my students uh, can look to the future also as a possibility of a place of a, a job place in the future. So uh, I think that I hope they enjoyed uh, this lecture and they, they, see, they can see a, a different kind of uh, approach uh, to the fusion. Okay, thanks again, uh, Michele. Uh, thanks for the, the uh, people attending this uh, very nice uh, uh, talk. And uh, Michele, we'll see you next week for <laughs> our joint work. And uh, okay. bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye to everybody. Thank you very much. Bye bye. bye, -bye.